Yeah, that's the uh, intention. So I'm really excited. I'm really excited to be part of this. So hello, everyone. It's really a great honor to be the first speaker at the English track for Dartup Conference. I've been following the conference for a long time as, a, as an audience. This year, I had the chance to speak to you about Flutter and actually how it is working under the hood. Let me tell you a bit about myself. My name is Sally. I'm a Flutter and Dart Google developer expert, and I've been doing Flutter apps for a long time. And one of the topics that are really important for me is to understand how Flutter works, because we write the code and everything, but there are a lot of concepts that make in Flutter special. And I think we are missing it while we ignore the importance of the topic. So today we will learn about those. First things first. First, we will go and check out the Flutter SDK's architecture and learn about that in detail. The second part will be about platform embedders and platform channels. The platform embedder and platform channels are actually the information or the parts that we are using for the hosting platform. And the other part is widget creation and state manipulation. We know what state management is if we have done any Flutter apps before. But the important point is how the Flutter renders the widgets on the screen and how do we understand actually it is on the screen in the way that we want it. Mm -hmm. And lastly, layout and rendering. We have the information, we have the widgets, but how do we pass that data into the proper addresses and have the, have the view that we want on the screen? So let's start with Flutter SDK's architecture. I mean, if you are here, you already know what Flutter is. Flutter is Google's cross-platform UI toolkit. The idea of Flutter is to have the code once and run it everywhere possible with as much sharing code as possible. This way, you also need to have high performance because even though you share the code, if you don't have high performance, there's no point of having an SDK like this, right? So for doing this, Flutter, team had thought about an architectural understanding. And while they were thought of thinking about it, they thought about, OK, let's do a layered architecture. And it should be heavily layered. And this heavily layered architecture is really important for us because any part of the layers are interchangeable. Let's check this really famous uh, architectural overview. You can see that we have on the bottom embedder, on top of it engine, and on top of it framework. This tree also has different layers inside it that we will talk about in a second in detail. As you all know, Flutter is supporting mobile, desktop, and web. One thing about web is that even though everything with Flutter is working fine for it, but at one level, which is the embedder level, Flutter doesn't do what it's supposed to do for web instead of while it is doing perfectly for mobile and desktop. And the reason is Flutter web engine is written with C++ and it is designed to interface with underlying operating system. But while we are working with web, we actually do not care about the underlying operating system that much. So a different approach was needed to do it. And on the web, Flutter wanted to have a re-implementation of the engine from on top of the standard APIs that we use on browsers. So there are two options to use actually Flutter, show co Flutter content on web, HD HTML and WebGL. In HTML mode, Flutter simply uses HTML, CSS, and Canvas on an, and an SVG. But on the WebGL, it uses a SCIA compiled web, web assembly called Canvas Kit. While HTML mode offers the best code size characteristics, Canvas Kit provides the fastest path to browser's graphics stack and offers somewhat higher graphical fidelity with the native mobile targets. So if you have higher understanding about code and if you want to manipulate more, you can go with HTML. But overall, you can always rely on Canvas Kit at the end. So this was the only thing about web that we need to keep in mind. From this point onwards, what we are going to be talking about is the Flutter's overall architecture that we have seen here. So 
Let's start from the bottom and go to top. The first part is embedder. Embedder is actually, it is something that is providing us an entry point to the application. You can think of activities on Android and so on. And it also gives you a lot of information from the embedded platform because embedder is actually getting the information from you from the platform that you want to have the app on. It, for example, it gives you or provides a coordinate system to reach the systems such as rendering surfaces, accessibility, inputs from servers, message event loops. One thing about the embedder level to keep in mind is it is written with the language of the platform. So if it's for Android, it is using Java and C++ because back in the days, Android was more Java oriented. Same goes for iOS and macOS. Back in the days, it was more Objective-C oriented and Objective-C++ oriented. So for iOS and macOS, they're using it. And for Windows and Linux, it is using C++. So when you go one step backward and think about the embedder level, it is the native platform that we have that is keeping our app working. It has all the native information that we need. And actually, it is showing the app natively, directly, and provides us information from the platform. So that part happens on the embedder, on the very bottom. By the way, using the embedder, Flutter code can be integrated into an existing application as a module. You can think of an Android module as an example. You can get the Flutter, put it to, the, put it to your application, and address the Flutter activity from your actual activity and navigate to it, and you wouldn't even notice the difference. You just need to keep in mind to keep the engine running and everything so you don't have any glitches and so on in between. But overall, your Flutter app can live in your native app in any platform that you can think of thanks to this. So now the embedded part is kind of okay. We understand what's going on. Let's go one step up, the engine part. From my perspective, engine part is the most hardworking part because it takes care of a lot of things. It is doing rasterizing composited scenes and it is doing a lot of low level implementations like graphics, text, file and network input output operations. Again, it brings the accessibility support from the embedder level to the engine. So it supports that over there and even at the higher level as well. In addition, when you have your plugins running, when you have your runtimes running, you actually have those inside the engine as well. And overall for your Flutter application, it keeps the Dart runtime and compile tools chain for you. At the, call, at the core of Flutter, we have the Flutter engine. You can think it like this. It supports all the primitives necessary for Flutter application to run and actually communicate between the embedder side. The engine side has been written with C++. So you can see that a lot of low level operations for the language side and also the Flutter side has been happened here. So now we have talked about the embedder part, right? We know how it is. We know that it is from our hosting platform. Now we have went through the engine. We know that engine is important for all the primitive operations that we can think of, like file operations, network operations, and many more. Now let's talk about the framework part. This is the part that we actually spend the most time on. When we write applications, we are most likely be touching these areas. So if you look at the words like material, cupertino, widgets, you might be hearing some buzzwords that are actually really, really familiar to your needs or to you. So you can see that this is the part that you will be actually spending the most of your time with. In addition to this, it has a really important point. The engine is exposed here through the Dart UI, which is a framework uh, that is wrapping up the C++ code uh, to Dart classes. This library exposes the lowest level primitives such as classes for driving input, graphics, and text rendering subsystems. 
I'm think I'm saying graphics and text rendering differently because text is something really, really special. Text rendering in all platforms is actually the hardest point of rendering something on the screen because it requires a lot of attention. It requires a lot of knowledge about the font styles, uh, languages, and special type of characters and so on and so forth. And it, even with the accessibility, accessibility support that it brings out to the table with engines and uh, embedder, it really actually puts extra special attention to it. <clears throat> so this part is mostly with Dart, all the C++ stuff and all the native stuff is already down below. So in here, when we communicate, we use Dart language. It also brings out a, a rich set of platform layout and foundation libraries. So we can compose series of layers. So let's check out. We have the foundation here. This is the part that is encapsulated in the C++ libraries from the Flutter framework. On top of it, we have animation, painting, and gestures. Gestures are the inputs that had happened on the layout platform that is delivered to us. Painting is painting the UI to uh, painting the UI to the platform over a canvas uh, by talking to the relative GPUs and so on. And lastly, the animation part. Animation part is the part that we actually constantly render the graphics on the screen in a way that it is shown in your application. And on top of it, we have the rendering part. Rendering part is for getting the information about the widgets that you have created and decide on where should they go and how should they behave and which layer they should be actually acting on. And on top of it, we have the abstraction over everything called Material and Cupertino. Material and Cupertino libraries are basically the widgets libraries that is keeping things more smoother for you and it is handling behind the scenes like animations and painting for you without tiring you up. So we already talked about like basic foundational classes in the foundation part. It also has the services that has been provided to us from the engine side. I skipped the widgets layer from here on purpose because I wanted to talk about it here. So widgets are really important. They provide a corresponding class for each render object in the rendering layer. We will talk about what render object is in a couple, in a couple of seconds. It allows you to define combinations of classes that you can reuse. So you can compose a set of widgets and create one widget there to actually use it. This is a layer that reactive programming model has introduced. Apps update their user interfaces in response to the events. And the, they tell to the framework to replace a widget in the hierarchy with another widget if something has changed. The framework then compares the new and old widgets and efficiently updates the user interface. So this re uh, reactive programming model is constantly listening and in any change in the system, it actually brings back the information to you. Flutter has its own implementations of each UI control. So everything you, that you see on the screen is customly implemented. So you have control over all the pixels that you see on the screen. It keeps a Dart implementation for iOS switch, for example, and Android, uh, Android radio, um, switch as well. But everything, even the tiniest operation has been calculated by the framework by us. This way you have actually unlimited extens extensibility. So you can get the iOS switch and you can turn it into something that you want. Also, if you have a if you have a platform that constantly needs to get and bring the UI to you, it will give you a performance bottleneck after a point. Flutter is taking care of that for you because Flutter uses its own graphics engine. And thanks to that, whatever you have, whatever you have written as a code will translate itself into something that you already know, but in a performant way. Also, it decouples the application behavior from any operating system dependencies. So whatever it is changing or broken, it's not broken on your end. 
or simply thinking material design has been introduced to the Android world from Android 5.0. Flutter applications support material design from Android 4.3. So you can have a material design app on a really old device, even though it doesn't support it, thanks to this approach. So now we talked about Flutter SDK architecture. I know it was an overview, but at the same time, there were a lot of information to keep in mind, but again, we are here to learn about how Flutter works at the end, right? So Flutter framework is relatively small. Like many higher level functions or features that developers might need are implemented by packages or plugins that uh, we have heard of. So if you have developed any Flutter application be before, you might heard pub.dev and packages and pubspec.yaml sort of buzzwords. And these are the important points that we're going to be talking about now. Imagine that you need a camera. Camera is highly platform dependent thing. For using it, you need to have a way of communicating with the platform to get the information out of it. And we are doing this by using platform embedder parts platform channel. Platform Embedder is responsible for providing an entry point like we talked about before. It initializes the Flutter engine. It obtains the UI thread and rastering thread so you can actually pass down any important UI operation to that place. And it also creates a texture for you. As we've seen, rather than being translated into the equivalent OS widgets, we are creating a user interface built and laid out composite by our, our system. So Flutter, whatever we have written on Flutter, it is actually directly laid out inside the system in our own way. The mechanism for updating the texture and participating in the app life cycle of the underlying operating system is really important and changes according to the platform. This is like non-negotiable. That is why the engine is pl uh, platform agnostic, presenting a stable application binary interface it is providing a platform embedder to do these operations for us. Platform embedder is also responsible for window sizing, thread management, and platform management as well. Flutter includes platform embedders for Android, iOS, Windows, macOS, and Linux. But you can also have your own custom platform embedder for the platform that you're in. So you can have, I mean, it is. Uh, Linux space, but think of Raspberry Pi, but you can have Raspberry Pi working for you as a custom embedder only for Raspberry Pi if you want to. So this also gives you a high level control over the operating system that you are hosted on as well. The platform embedder is the native operating system application that is hosting everything. So. You can have Flutter Activity or Flutter UI controller for any platform that you're in. And it is the glue between the host and the guest, which is the Flutter system. Let's take, talk about the platform embedders per platform. And on Android, as I told multiple times, we are loading the host as an activity. The view is controlled by a Flutter view. It renders the Flutter content with view and texture. So we have this Flutter view or Flutter activity, or even you can have Flutter fragment to have your everything that you have on the uh, Flutter side coming and working for you. We will talk about how you can actually send the information from that side to the Android in a second. But right now, think about it from the UI perspective. You just give a canvas loaded with an activity to the Flutter and it uses it in a way that it wants it to. Same thing goes for iOS and macOS. For iOS, you have UI view controller. For macOS, you have NS view controller. It creates a Flutter engine, serves as a host again, and it also keeps a dark virtual machine and your Flutter runtime in it. It creates a Flutter view controller and it attaches itself to the Flutter engine and either it's, it uses Coco or UI, to, UI Kit uh, and send the events of Flutter, send the events to the Flutter and shows the, shows the frames by using Flutter Engine in either with Metal or OpenGL. 
back in the days there were some problems along the way while changing the changing from changing to a new UI raster and you can you could see some new flutter approaches along the way and there were some problems with the UI restoring but now everything is gone because it is supporting the new metal uh, uh, UI renderer for you. So for Windows, it is used in the traditional Windows Win32 app. It is used in Angle, a library that translates OpenGL API to the DirectX 11. And content is rendered using simply this one. They are trying to make it better. Their efforts are currently under the way to also offer a Windows embedder using the UWP model. But right now it doesn't. So you are stick with the angle right now. Now let's talk about platform channels. As I said, now you have your UI rastering and everything is working fine. But at the same time, you are missing a communication level. For mobile and desktop apps, Photo allows you to call into custom code through a platform channel. These are logical bridges between your host and your Flutter application. You can send a, a primitive types, also a list of string between these platforms, and you can create a common channel. You can send and receive messages between Dart and the host. And you can use Kotlin or Swift, including Java or Objective-C as well. Data is serialized from Dart type like map into a standard format. So you just use key value pairs to send the information. And once you send this information, you can actually get and read it on the host platform or in the Dart platform. Platform channels are quite straightforward to use. You can just, you just simply create a channel give it a name and send the data in it. The platform view is a bit more complicated. Flutter has Android view and UI kit view. The reason that we have this view is sometimes we need to have a reference to a specific view from the host. And this host view needs to be shown in our Flutter application. One of the ways that it has been used was the early adaptations of Google Maps application. It was using the Google Maps from the host platform and bringing it onto the screen and rendering it constantly. So by saying rendering it constantly, you can understand that it is an expensive operation. So even though we have a chance to use platform views and show it, actually, it is a bit different. It is quite heavy. It shouldn't be used as much as you don't need it, but platform views is a thing in the Flutter's ecosystem that you can keep in mind once you need something out of it. Flutter content is drawn into the texture and it's visually entirely internal. There's no place for something like Android view. And Flutter's internal model of render inter doesn't, uh, doesn't interleave with in Flutter widgets. So, once you want to get rid of this problem, you can simply use this stuff, but overall, you can stay away from it. You can have it for browser control or maps example, like I said. Cool. Now we talked about platform embedders. Now we know how the view comes, how we can use the view and show it on the screen. If you want to, we can use platform views. We can know how we can communicate with the view as well. So that's perfect. But let's talk about widget creation and state manipulation to understand how things are simply working for Flutter. On the surface, Flutter is simply a reactive pseudo declarative UI framework in which the developer provides a mapping from application state to the interface state. So you have an information and you have a representation in the UI. And the framework takes on the task of updating the interface at runtime when the application state changes to its reactive paradigm. This model is in inspired by that has been done by React before from Facebook, which includes a, a rethinking of many traditional design principles. In most traditional UI frameworks, the user interface's initial state is described once and then separately updated by user code with user code at runtime. In response to events, one challenge of this approach is that the, as the application grows in complexity, the developer needs to be aware of how state changes cascade throughout the entire UI. 
for fixing this problem, Flutter already brought up its own architectural aspect, which is uh, it, the main components for this. These are simple building blocks that are immutable classes and used as the configuration objects in the widget tree. You might hear these from several Flutter talk in the way that everything is a widget, everything is a widget because everything that you will be writing at the end, if you don't go deeper, will be a widget. Flutter is, as it's called, a series of mechanisms for efficiently walking the modified parts of trees, converting trees of objects into level, ter level trees of objects and propagating changes across these trees at the end. I'm seeing multiple trees all the time. The reason is widgets are not a law. We will talk about it in a second, but we need to keep in mind that even though we have been told everything's a widget, it's not widget all the time. It's not only the widgets all the time. One thing to keep in mind is composition over inheritance with Flutter and some widgets. As mentioned, Flutter emphasizes widgets as a unit of composition. So we have the building blocks as widgets. And each widget is an immutable declaration of part of the user interface. For example, there is a widget called container, a commonly used widget. You might probably heard of it. It is made of made up of several widgets like padding, decoration, uh, box, sorry, box decoration, a line, and so on. So you can see that even inside Flutter, it is there is a heavy composition over inheritance happening. It would be a rare application that drew only a single widget. An important part of any UI framework is therefore to be able to be able to have an efficient way of laying out hierarchy of widgets. Determining the size of and um, position of each element before they are rendered on the screen is also an important point. That's why we have multiple trees and these trees are sending information about the top and bottom level to each other. But while we send these information and so on, we also need to have the triggers to actually change something on the screen when it's happening. And we do that, do that by state manipulation. State manipulation is happening by several aspects. You can use different libraries like block, Redux, provider, and so on. But SDK is also offering at the very heart of what you have two main widgets. It is called stateless widget and stateful widget. Many widgets have no mutable state. These are extending from stateless widgets. But if you are extending from stateful widget, you can actually have the stateful widget inside. So for example, you can think of future builder or stream builder. And when you check the code out, you can see that it's actually at the end a stateful widget. If the unique characteristics of a widget needs to change, then you can use stateful widget for it. Whenever you mutate a state object that is created with the stateful widget, you must call set state. This set state is really important because each time there's a change on your application, your Flutter framework needs to know it to recreate the view on the screen. Having a separate state and widget objects lets other widgets treat both stateless and stateful widget exactly the same. So this way you can see that stateful widget itself is immutable as well, but the state object inside it is the one that is doing the mutability for us. The framework is doing all the work for us, finding and reusing the existing widgets and getting information from the state objects and keeping the state objects in an efficient way as well. As widget trees get deeper, however, passing state information up and down can be a bit tricky. So stateful widget might be a bit more overhead because you might be needing to do a lot of dependency injection throughout the cons uh, constructors and it can really tire you up. We don't want this one. What we want is we want to have a simpler way of sending because we already have a tree structure and we can go uh, by direction on it. So Flutter created a new widget called inherited widget to pass down this information from top to bottom and use the context as the reference on the uh, on the tree. So even though we are talking about stateless widget and stateful widget for state manipulation, 
once there's need, you can use a third object called inherited widget as well. Inherited widget gives you a way to easily grab the data from the ancestor. It also gives you a way to listen to the changes on the ancestor and rebuild the child when something has changed as well. So now at this point, we know how the Flutter SDK architecture has been created, how the platform embedders and platform channels has been working. We gave a stop. We talked about widget creation and state manipulation to understand how the over at the surface how the state manipulation is working, what is state management, what is stateless widget, what is stateful widget, and what is inherited widget. Now, lastly, we will talk about layout and rendering because we always talked about it will create itself, it will do this, it will do that, but we didn't talk about how it is doing it. So in Flutter Technic, everything is not a widget. Flutter's widget layer introduces a composition mechanism using the reactive paradigm to manipulate the underlying rendering tree. This SPI abstracts out the tree manipulation by combining the tree creation and tree mutation steps into a single tree description. Where after each change in the system state, the new configuration of the user is described by the developer and the framework computes the series of the tree mutations necessary to reflect this, necessary to reflect this new configuration. We have three, three tree structures. One of them is called widget, the other one is called elements, the last one is called render objects. We have talked about widget several times. Widget is the disposable one, widget is the simple one, immutable one. It is the core building block that we can just use and throw out and recreate. They are lightweight and it can be used later on. The complicated ones start with this. It is something called element. Element is the middle person that is doing the heavy work for us. Keeps the logic inside it, keeps the parent and child information, and most importantly, keeps the state object in it as well. The general approach is to match up the beginning and the end of both child lists by comparing the runtime type and key of each widget. Potentially finding a non-empty range in the middle of each list that contains all the matched children. The framework then replaces the children in the range of the old child list into a hash table based on their keys. Next, the framework walks the range in the new child list and queries the hash table by key for matches. Unmatched children are discarded and rebuilt, scratch whereas matched children are rebuilt with their new widgets. So what element is doing basically when you think simpler is it compares the previous and new versions and checks out if something has changed in the same level. It checks, okay, I can use this one again because it is the same type. I will use this one, but if the type has changed, then it says, okay, let me create a new one. This way, element doing the heavy work for us to actually keep the heavy objects to show the UI or show, uh, keep the information about it. Speaking of showing the UI, we have the last three called three called render object. The render object is the base class class for every render node. Its parent gets the information before laying the UI. It gets the information like size and color, and it just sends the information to the GPU to actually render the render the UI to the screen. In response to the user input or whatever it is coming, and element can become dirty and it can actually tell the render object, no, okay, something is going to change. So just keep that in mind. And let's go here. So since something is, can be changed and the way that we show the UI can change as well, element is constantly contact in contact with render object. It tells, okay, keep this information, take this information, you can keep the object that you are in, but use this color, use this size, and so on. So when it becomes dirty, render object starts to listen to element and it says, okay, 
I'm I'm on hold. I'm listening to you. I, just send me the information. Just send me the information. And once it has information, then it sends it. The render object sends it to the proper places. The constraints come from top to the bottom, but the size of the child is passed to the top, so it can actually cover the area of the child by the parents. So render objects are also passive. They have the constraints and color information, but at the same time, they are sending back information to the top as well. So the information goes bi-directional. So you can think that why do we have three, dif three different trees in the system? Why don't we have one rigid tree and just deal with everything? The reason is first performance, because since widgets are disposable and some objects can be reused, thanks to these extra tree structures, the per performance can be increased. Also the clarity, like, like each operation has its own concern or its own duty. So each concerned part needs to be handled by the proper place that they belong in. And also it comes with the type safety. So these three main reasons are the reasons that actually we have for having these three different uh, trees. So how does widget element and render object work together? I draw this UI to give you a brief information and I will show you in an example quickly. So imagine that you have a UI interaction happening. If it happens, and it, if it's calling to change the set state, then whatever we have on the screen is marked as dirty. And it checks out the dirty elements, keeps the, uh, keeps the one that needs to be updated and clears out the ones that shouldn't be updated. Goes unidirectionally to understand what needs to be changed. If it is not going to change, then it will mark it clean. Other way around, it will create a new one. So you can think as simple as that. Let's see it in the example. If you are working with Flutter 2.5 and higher, this is a new skeleton app to show the light team, dark team, and so on. And you have examples. So how I implemented this is I just put a button here and put random elements. And before it will look like having sample item 54, sample item 10 and 56 with the light theme, it will have different items in the dark theme. So it will technically change everything on the screen. But is it going to reuse the same objects? Let's see it on action. In the before part, you can check that the text object that is having sample item 54 has a render paragraph object with ID, let me read it because I can't see it, 58EE8. So you can see that it is using a render paragraph, which is a render object that is laying out a text for us with an ID 58EE8 for us. Then I click the button and change the UI and change the uh, theme. And I go back and run it, run this one. You can see that the text has changed from simple item 54 to 35, but we are still using the same render paragraph. So this is the main idea that, that we always need to keep in mind. The idea is we need to understand a lot of heavyweight objects that we have on Flutter side is going to be kept as long as it is the same type in the same level for Flutter itself. So let me go back to my slides because I lost my view. OK, perfect. So to sum up, Flutter slogan is everything is a widget, but we have talked about platform views, render objects, I don't know, elements, a lot of architectural things. And you can see that it is revolving around building user interfaces by composing not only widgets, but all the information together into one big chunk of important library. The result of this aggressive composition on each layer is bringing up the number of widgets that we require in a way that 
it is diagnosed carefully and it is lower level than we, so lower number that we expect it to be. And all the data structures and lookup times of these three structures and so on are really, really fast as well. So it brings also the best out of the information and the performance as well. So whatever we have seen so far are the decisions that is making Flutter special and performant in any level that we can think of. So that's all from me, people. Thank you very much for listening to me. I really appreciate your time. And yeah, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. Okay, thank you. That was an excellent presentation and especially the first one on the first day. Wow, that was very good. Thank you, thank you, thank you very thank much. You. And we have a very good question uh, from Marcus. And the question is, how about RDK, Apple TV OS, Samsung Tizen or even LG Web OS? Will Flutter support any of these platforms in the future? Uh, to be honest, I've seen proof of concepts that Apple is running, on, uh, sorry, Flutter is running on TV OS and TZ and devices somehow, but with the custom embedder, you can do this by yourself. Flutter doesn't support it from the first class perspective, but think about the Raspberry Pi example. Raspberry Pi is a platform itself, it's using Linux on the basis. You can create your own embedder and run Flutter DOS there. But Flutter is already supporting a lot of places right now. So I don't think that the first class attendance will not happen for these platforms soon. OK, thank you. And I don't see any more questions from the chat, but I have one from myself. Uh, do you think this knowledge, like how this knowledge of the architecture of Flutter SDK will be useful to an ordinary Flutter developer? This is an excellent question. So right now, most of the play, uh, developers like ourselves, we are using Flutter's widgets that they provide to us. But when the time comes, when you actually reach the level of Flutter, you need to do some things by yourself. The biggest example that we have came across was uh, we are doing a rich text editor for our application and we needed to understand how the text is working in Flutter. So we need to really go deep dive and do changes in even in the engine level to make things available for our rich text editing purposes. So first place is uh, that you might need this information is when you reach to the level or when you reach to the edge of Flutter ecosystem and you need to do something more with it, then you will use this information. Another point is if you have performance problems, once you understand this, you can implement your code or your platform in a way that it actually can have a better performance by using simple tricks that we can think out of it. For example, we know that in the same level, if we have the same widget, we don't need to recreate it. We don't need to recreate the widget. And this shows that if we are careful with our implementation and decisions in the code level, we can simply have a better performance with not needing to create heavy objects at the end. So I think from the beginner level to the expert level, it is something really important to understand how Flutter works from our work and job perspective. OK, thank you. And we have. A new question from the chat, uh, and the question is, do you think Flutter is faster than React Native? Uh, I, will, I don't want to make comments about this. I would say that it depends on how you make, how you, how you do implementations. Both platforms are great, both SDKs are doing what they're supposed to do. So if you mean by faster than performance, I'm sure I can find really good performance React Native apps as well as Flutter apps. So there's no real comparison between. And development speed also depends on several inputs like what size of team that you have, what background of team members that you have and so on. So I can't say a definite answer about this, unfortunately. 